We are a family of ordinary people. We all come from different backgrounds and experiences to create one body of Christ. We are actively being transformed by Christ. We let His sacrifice impact our lives daily so we may grow to be more like Him. We empower and encourage one another to go out and make a change in our world. We consistently come together to make an impact in our community. We are ordinary people being changed by Christ to change the world. Man, it's good to see everybody here this morning. You know, it's first Sunday of the new year. Here we are, ready to go, ready to do everything. And I mean, it's just really good to have you here. So why are you here? Kind of a weird question for the pastor to ask, right? What are you doing here? But I mean, really, you think about it, why am I here? Why are you here? Why are any of us here? And I don't mean that in some weird, you know, existential thing about why are we here, you know, because that one's easy. We're here to glorify God and enjoy him forever, right? That's an easy thing. But the reality is we fail to understand sometimes God has you where you are for a reason, And we need to be mindful of that because, because let me just ask, why is it that when God looked down at Gardner, Kansas, he decided Grace Baptist Church needed to be here? There are a lot of good churches in Gardner already, right? So why did God look down and go, you know what, Grace needs to be here too. Go deeper. Why did he say you need to be at Grace today, right? I mean, some of you are like, hey, we're checking this thing out. Some of you are like, man, we're fully on committed. Some of you are here going, what is this guy? This is my first time I ever walked in here. I came for the coffee. You know, but whatever it is, we're here for a reason. And why is that? What is God about doing? So we're starting a brand new year now. And what we're going to be doing is unpacking something powerful. We're putting a name to why God has put us here. Why has God got, given us what he's given us? Why are we here? Why has God been bringing all the people here that he's bringing? Why are we getting the, the um, uh, people coming in with all these resources and all these giftings and all these strategies and all these ideas and all this, who is you, right? I mean, why is all this coming together? Why is God bringing it in? Why is God bringing it now? So what we're going to be doing over the next several weeks, something a little different, but over the next several weeks, we're going to be unpacking our focus and our vision for the coming year, right? How are we going to be reaching out to our people around us? How are we going to be navigating this thing called church? Because you guys realize, like I was saying, God has given the church for a reason, and this church exists for a reason. I mean, don't you want a little more in your Christianity? Don't you want to see God do a little more in you and then through you? Don't you want to see our community grow closer to God too? Don't you want to see lives out there transformed and impacted by the same gospel that transforms and impacts every one of us, right? Don't you want to see that? Now, when we're talking more, we're not necessarily meaning bigger. We're talking about deeper, more impact. We're talking about feeling the fulfillment the purpose, and the drive of what Jesus has called us to do. Church should make a difference, right? You go back to the book of Acts, and uh, we're still in Matthew 4, don't leave there, right? But you go back to the book of Acts, and you find that when the believers came into Thessalonica, they were saying, man, these people who have turned the world upside down have come here too. They considered Christianity to be flipping the world upside down, right? Don't you want our church to be part of that? Don't you want your life to be a part of that? Because the reality is, as we share Jesus, people are going to respond in one of two ways. They're going to look and go, I hate everything that you are, and we have to be ready to wear that. Or they're going to look and say, I want what you got. And that's what we got to be ready to do. Does your life do that? Does our church do that? Is that the impact that we are seeing come from our living the gospel? Because Jesus did not come to launch a club. He came to launch a church. He came to assemble the body of Christ together, to gather us, to hear, to respond, then to send us out into the world that would result in a world-changing mission. That's what he came to do. Now, do you want that, right? Is that what your heart is crying out for? Do you believe it can happen? Do you believe that you can be part of the greatest movement of God ever? Okay, some of y'all here. That's good. (laughs) Go to the book of Matthew. Matthew. What Jesus is doing in our church, what Jesus is doing in the other churches in Gardner, what Jesus is doing across the country right now, right? The world is the same thing that he started 2,000 years ago on the shores of Galilee, 
right? This is this scene. Jesus has just in our text come in from uh, the wilderness temptation. He just beat Satan with an ugly stick, and now he's coming in to his disciples. He's walking on the shore, and in verse 18, it says, while he was walking by the Sea of Galilee, he saw two brothers, Simon, who is called Peter, Andrew, his brother, casting a net into the sea. Why would they be doing that? Well, for they were fishermen. And he said to them, follow me, and I will make you fishers of men. Immediately they left their nets, and they followed him. And going on from there, he saw two other brothers, James, the son of Zebedee, and John, his brother, in the boat with Zebedee, their father, mending their nets, and he called them. Immediately they left the boat and their father, and they followed him. And he went throughout all Galilee, teaching in their synagogues, proclaiming the gospel of the kingdom, healing every disease and every affliction among the people, so that his fame spread throughout all Syria, and they brought him all the sick and those afflicted with various diseases and pains, those oppressed by demons, those having seizures and paralytics, and he healed them. And great crowds followed him from Galilee and the Decapolis, from Jerusalem and Judea, and from beyond the Jordan, right? Immediately, Jesus comes, he finds his disciples, he gives them a calling, he gives them a purpose, and he gives them a mission, right? A lot of times, we think we're the ones in the way of what God is trying to do. We're actually the ones through whom God is trying to do it. Does that make sense? He's calling us. He's calling you. And he starts here with a very familiar mission. I mean, he goes to these fishermen, and he goes, hey, I'm going to make you fish. This was familiar to them, but then he expanded it. He said, but you're going to be fishing for men. And I think that's what God is still doing in the churches today. He's calling us to the familiar. We're supposed to follow him. We're supposed to let him change who we are. We're supposed to go on mission for him, but yet he he brings it down a little deeper so that we see how he's going to do that through us in our unique place. Because guys, grace is a unique church. New Life is a unique church. FBC is a unique church. We can keep going on and on. And guess what? Gardner needs every one of us. But what's unique about us? Where do we fit in to the scheme of how God is working in our city, right? Where do we fit into the scheme of how God is working in your family? Where do you fit into the scheme that God is moving in who you are and where you work, where you live, where you eat, sleep, play, whatever? How is God moving there? It's not a mystery, if you've been hanging around here for a little bit, that our church is growing, right? I mean, we're getting bigger. We got parking issues. We got all kinds of things that we're trying to do. But you know what you do see? Let's get inside the building for a second. You see a lot of new faces. You see a lot of new stories. You see a lot of of things that have been changing in our church for the last couple of years. And about a year ago, our staff started meeting. We started praying with leadership. We started kind of looking at, okay, who are we now, you know? Because I tell you guys this about every five years, our church will look different five years from now than it does today, right? And guess what? I'm a prophet, apparently, (laughs) because it keeps doing it, right? God keeps bringing new people in. God keeps bringing more, more giftings that we didn't have before, more people with skill sets we didn't have before. He is enlarging our ministry constantly here, guys. And we believe that comes, bless you, with a stewardship We believe that comes with a job for us to do. So we started looking at this thing, going, okay, God, who are we now? God, what are you doing in us? How are you moving? What what do you want us to be focused on, and how do you want us to grow based on what you're already doing? So we didn't sit around one day and go, gee, what kind of church do we want to be? We didn't do that. We looked at what God was already growing us into. And here's where we landed. In the year, here's our focus. We are ordinary people being changed by Christ to change the world. That's what we are. Ordinary people being changed by Christ to change the world. Sounds great, doesn't it? (laughs) Because the reality is over the next several weeks, we're going to be unpacking all of what this means. So if this is your first time joining us at Grace today, boy, you picked a great time to join us at Grace. (laughs) Because we're unpacking something that's going to be new to about 99% of our people, right? Right? But this is who we are. This is what we've kind of grown into. And this is how we believe God is going to be using us in the future and how we're going to be reaching out to our community even deeper, how we're going to be building community within our church even better, how we're going to be helping people to see that we can serve in the ordinary because Jesus is changing us and we can make a life-changing difference to everybody around us. 
right? Now, over the next several weeks, we'll be unpacking every bit of that, but we have to start with understanding what do we mean when we say ordinary people being changed by Christ to change the world, right? What are we even talking about? How do we, how do we understand this, right? So let's just begin here. First, we're ordinary people. That's who we are. We're just ordinary people. Look at your neighbor and say, wow, how ordinary you are. <laughs> yes. Yeah. I promise you guys, the first service, they're just as ordinary as we are. <laughs> you know? Ordinary, a little weird, a little different, but good. When you look at people, you basically get to see a grand buffet of everything the same. Because we do. We live in a, a society that basically flaunts, they, they purport, they want everything to be bigger, better, badder, right? I mean, you can't show any weakness, don't do that. We, I mean, you think about, we have like our, our, I know some of you are part of the like, like fantasy football leagues in our church and stuff like that. You Boy, you do the draft and you get all in this because you're drafting the people. I figure fantasy football is enough. I'll just fantasize about it and it'll be great. But you guys are really into that. And what are you trying to draft? I mean, the NFL, what are they trying to draft in real life? The biggest, the best, the fastest. And Jesus looks at all that and goes, yeah, y'all, that ain't it. In fact, when Jesus is looking for the heroes of the faith, here's what he says. I want to read from 1 Corinthians chapter 1, just to let you know this. Paul is talking to the church at Corinth, and here's what he says. For consider your calling, brothers. Not many of you were wise according to worldly standards. Not many were powerful. Not many were of noble birth. <laughs> Thanks, Paul. <laughs> but God shows what is foolish in the world to shame the wise. God shows what is weak in the world to shame the strong. God shows what is low and despised in the world, even things that are not to bring to nothing the things that are, so that no human being might boast in the presence of God. And because of him, you are in Christ Jesus, who became to us the wisdom of God, righteousness and sanctification and redemption, so that as it is written, let the one who boasts, boast in the Lord. Here's the reality. When God is looking across for who am I going to use, he's looking for the ordinary people. That's who we are, guys. The, the Christianity, the heroes of... I'm having Steve Urkel images. Did I do that? I don't know, whatever. Y'all know who that is? Okay, okay, just checking. <laughs> Sometimes I real, feel really old. <laughs> what was I talking about? Jesus. Okay, we're back. <laughs> Ordinary people. <laughs> this is actually perfect because what I was about to say is the heroes of Christianity are not the ones on the stage, Right? The heroes of Christianity are not, and here's what we've done so wrong in churches. We make our pastors celebrities, our praise team rock stars, and all of you are supposed to just come and hear the show. That is not biblical Christianity. Because the thing is, Jesus is looking for us in the ordinary. Just who we are, where we are, our hurts, our brokenness, our joys, our victories, our, our damages, and our healings. All of that, it's ordinary. David did not kill Goliath when he was a king. He did it when he was a shepherd. Gideon was the runt of the litter when God said, hey, deliver my people from the land of Midian. I mean, this is the idea. Do you believe that God can use you? When's the first time you realized God can use you and does use you? Because here's the reality. When he went to here and he goes to find his disciples, he did not run to the seminaries. He did not run to the places where everybody was athletic and all these things. He went to find fishermen. That's what he did. The ordinary. Why? Because the ordinary is accessible. Do you realize that God is accessible to you? Do you realize that when you follow God, others will see that as accessible to you? We get in a really weird place a lot of times where we look at people and we're like, boy, they're really strong in the faith. And we get this mindset, I could never be that. You know what I'm saying? But when they just see ordinary people, when the world just sees ordinary people living their life for Jesus, ordinary people with the same hurts, the same struggles, the same everything they got, then we find the gospel is not only accessible, but it is also rela re relatable. I love standing in the back and watching all of you worship. I mean, I'm worshiping too, right? And, and I'm singing and all this. But I get to hear some of your stories. And we pray together. And I know some of the struggles you guys are going through, right? 
You know some of my struggles, right? That's, that's we're ordinary people. But when I'm back there and I'm watching you and I know what you're going through, I know what you've had this week, and yet your hand is raised in worship. Yet you're praising God. It changes everything. Because that gives me strength to praise God too. What if it could give others? What if we understood that God serves in the ordinary? That God calls us in the ordinary? Ordinary people. That's me, that's you. That's our faces. I mean, you look around this room today, and what do you find? You find people who are blue collar. You find people who are management. You find people who are unemployed. You find people who are working hard at home as house people, and you find all these different things. That's who we are. You find people who've been to Bible college. You find people who a month ago thought Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John were a boy band. And we got everybody in the middle. (laughs) That's who we are. You got people wearing jeans. You got people wearing coats, and you got people trying to rock them both. We're ordinary people. And that's what we always practice in this church, guys. We're not trying to be the cool, hip church. We are not trying to be the fuddy-duddy church. We're just the church for the rest of us. And that's what God is doing in our midst. Now, when we start thinking about this ordinary thing, and we start thinking about this great mission that God has called us to, you're the mission This is a crazy mission that God has sent us on, guys. He sends us into a hostile world to tell them about a Savior that they cannot see who will radically upheave their lives by saving them from something they don't think they need saving from. And it works. Why? It's not because we're great. Notice as they went through Galilee and they went through Syria, it was not their fame that spread. It was his fame. It was his gospel that spread. It was his power, not ours. I tell you guys this all the time, and I mean it from way down here. There are times you're going to look at me, and you're going to be so proud of me and so happy. You're going, wow, that's our pastor. And then there are times you're going to look at me and go, wow, that's our pastor. (laughs) You know? Because we're not perfect. We're ordinary. We don't always have it put together. We're ordinary people. We don't always know what to do. We don't always know how to pray. We don't always know the right thing to say because we're ordinary people. But look at what Jesus does through ordinary people. What does he do? He changes the world. But before he does that, he's going to change us. That's why we're not only ordinary people, we're ordinary people being changed by Christ. Look at the verse, um, go with me to verse 19 here. This is the kind of the, the gist of it. It says, and he said to them, follow me and I will make you. That's not a threat. That's a promise. <laughs> he will make us. Make us what? Make us to be fishers of men. Jesus almost immediately connects our calling with a purpose. You know, he's calling us to salvation. Then he connects it with a purpose. He says, I want you to grow here, man. I want you locked in. I want you doing something. But in that process, he is transforming us. The invitation went on from uh, uh, Peter, and John, uh, Peter and Andrew, and it went on to James and John. They all left their nets and their boats and their dad, and they followed Jesus. Guys, Jesus isn't just leaving us as ordinary people, right? He's transforming us. The invitation is to become, to think as Jesus thinks, to have his character, to continue his mission, to continue him, so that others get to see who we are, and they glorify Christ. That's the idea. And whenever we're looking at this invitation, follow me and I'm going to make you. Follow me, I'm going to remake you. I'm going to transform you. I'm going to fashion you into my image. It's not just a, oh yeah, sure. In the Greek language, the closest thing we have to it in English, the concept is, I do. That's the closest thing. You're talking life commitment. And when we commit to Jesus, (laughs) he starts to transform us. He starts to change everything. Guys, we want to be a church where people get transformed. Because far too often in our culture, in our world, the biggest problem I believe that we have in Christianity, and smarter people than me agree with me, is the fact that too many believers think and act just like unbelievers. What is wrong with us? Because here's what Jesus does. He gives us new desires. This is how he changes us. They're not even going to be fishing for fish anymore. They're fishing for something different now. New desires. Have your desires changed since you came to Jesus? 
Or do we still desire the same old traps, the same old whatevers we reached out to you before? New directions. <laughs> Used to you, boy, we lived our lives from death unto death. Now we live from life unto life, right? We have been freed from our sins. We have been set free from, from the things that used to hold us back from God. The, the separation is now undone because 2,000 years ago, this Jesus didn't stay on the shores of Galilee. He went to a cross. He bled and he died for our sins. He rose from the dead. He sets us free by pouring his spirit into us. Life gets new. Passions increase. And this is what he's doing. He changes the direction of who we are. It goes deeper. Now we have a purpose. He said, you're going to catch men. A purpose. A purpose. So many people in our culture, in our churches, what is our purpose? Why are we here? I asked you that earlier. Y'all thought I was joking. <laughs> Why are we here? For too many people, we're here because, well, we got to punch the clock. We're here because I've gotten into my routine life and I just can't break out of this thing. And I feel like there's more. I feel like there's something deeper. I've got to go more. But when we lack purpose, you know what we do? We create one. So we create a purpose of how can I get more money? And that never works. How we create a purpose, how can I get more for me? How can I make me happy? How can I just survive? And purpose becomes about surviving. Purpose becomes about getting. Purpose is messed up. And those things never satisfy. But Jesus, he's called us into something way bigger, way deeper, way stronger. This is what he's gifted us to do. He gives us something to do, a mission, a purpose. We'll talk about that. But that's where we want to land, is to be the church for your calling. How can we help you connect with what Jesus is doing in your life, in your strengths, in your pains, in your struggles, and in your situation? How can God work through that? How can God deal through that? How is he intending to use you through it? Man, we want to be the church for your calling. Because in our church's history, we've done a really good job, a really good job of empowering people to do ministry. What we've not done so well is equipping people to do what we empower them to do. We want to fix that, you know? We want to get people where we're able to dive into the scriptures and learn and know and teach others. We want to help people understand their gifting. What is it God's calling me to do? What is my purpose? How is God using my uniqueness here, my ordinariness, to reach out to the people around me? How's God doing that? This is why it's so powerful that we understand what kind of a disciple is it going to take? What kind of a disciple is it going to take to be changed by Christ? We feel like we need to be disciples who are with purpose and disciples who are on purpose. Reaching out to those around, strengthening within. And in this change, as Jesus changes our desires and our directions and our purpose, he also changes our connections. You look around our ordinary people, Pod here, pod people here, whatever. You look around, what do you see? You see people that outside of Jesus Christ, you might have nothing to do with otherwise. You know, some of us don't have the same hobbies. Some of us just don't kind of run in the same circles outside of Jesus. But yet we come into Jesus, and as he is changing us, he grows us together. And you know what starts happening? Man, we love each other, and we like each other, and we want to hang around each other. Whenever, you know, six months ago, we wouldn't have even talked in Walmart. <laughs> you know? But that's what he does. And some of those connections he's going to change in us are not connections out here, but they're connections in here. How things work together in us. Because we're just ordinary people being changed by Christ to change the world to change the world. Galilee, go back to verse 23. I want to read that again. It says, he was sent throughout all Galilee, teaching in their synagogues, proclaiming the gospel of the kingdom, healing every disease, every affliction among the people. So his fame spread throughout all of Syria. And they brought to him all those who were sick. Notice how he went first going to, and then they start coming to. You get that? As, he was, as the fame is spreading, <laughs> people start going, I can go there and be, be saved. I can go there. That's where life is. They started seeing that. But they were uh, afflicted by various diseases and pains. They were oppressed by demons. Those having seizures and paralytics, he was healing them. Great crowds were following from Galilee and the Decapolis, Jerusalem, Judea, from beyond the Jordan. All these things are happening. Do you believe God can do that through you? 
Because the Decapolis area is here throughout Galilee. It's more than just the Sea of Galilee. There was a whole region around that sea. They called Galilee, right? The land of Galilee. And it was a hub, man. It was densely populated. They had trade routes coming north, south, east, west. I mean, they're going through here. The people there had a very entrepreneurial spirit. They were like, man, we want different. We want new. It is a great place to start a revolution or preach the gospel. Sometimes both. <laughs> Because when you really get into the gospel, there will be a revolution in your life. It's going to change you. And it becomes our duty to take that gospel and start a revolution around us so that others hear it too. See, all these markings of what you read there in Matthew, where he's saying he was healing and casting out demons and exerting his authority here and doing all this, all those are tricks of the Messiah. They were showing the Messiah has come. The Messiah is doing this. It's a glimpse of the Messianic kingdom. And guys, we get that Messiah. But look out at the culture around us. We have families who are falling apart. And even if they don't fall apart, they're... Even if they don't fall apart, they're struggling. They're hurting. There is no purpose. Kids are going crazy. Families are barely surviving and they're wondering, is there a reason? This is why suicide is on the rise. This is why depression is coming up. This is why anxieties are so hard. This is why life is falling apart. We don't know Jesus. And let me tell you something. They need some Messiah right now. As the church, God has never called you to isolate from society. He hasn't called us to that. We are not to run from it. We are to run to it. We are to take the gospel to it. We are to allow Jesus to work through us. And guys, when we come together, this is what we want to get. We want you not to see yourself on mission to the world. That's too big. We want to see you on mission to your world. What we call the crowd cloud of the people you know the people you work with, the people you go to school with, the people that you encounter in your, your life. Because I promise you, you've got a hundred people that you can reach that I'll never meet. Remember, the heroes aren't the ones on the stage. You've got people who you know that need Messiah. You've got people you know. The mission field is not the nameless, faceless ones over there. The mission field are the ones who have names, faces, and you know their stories. You watch them as they come to work purposelessly. You watch them as they're trying to navigate their life at school as much as they can. You're watching them as they're just going through. And you're hearing them cry. You're seeing them. You, you know there's something wrong, but you have something that's right. Can we do that? Can we reach out? Guys, this is why our church works so hard with like Hope Market and our back snack programs and, and the things God is going to open up for us to do next. You ever hear that, the thing like you're watching TV or something? It's like the crocodile hunter or, or those people who explode things. They're like, don't do this on t uh, at home. Leave this to the professionals. Yeah, right? I want to tell you, don't leave this to the professionals because there aren't any. I love how Michael J. Fox says about people with struggling with diseases and Parkinson's in his case and these other things. He says the experts are the ones who are living with the disease. They're the experts. You are the expert of what God is doing in your life. You're the one who can say, this is how I'm hurting, but this is how God is helping me. That's you, that's me. We're the ordinary people, remember? And the thing is, your mess can highlight hope. Your brokenness can highlight his healing. Your joy can highlight his peace. Your story, as messed up or as sinful as whatever it came through, your story can highlight his grace. We can make a difference. How? As ordinary people. Man, changing the world's messy. And you know what? We're going to mess up doing it. We're going to make mistakes. There are times we're not going to say the right thing. We're going to be, we're ordinary, right? But that's part of the allure. Part of the allure. If we're vulnerable with what God is doing in us. If we allow God to have his perfect work and a bunch of ordinary people being changed by Christ to change the world. Now, guys, I'm going to tell you, this has about, been about a year journey for us as we've been looking through, hey, God, what are you doing? How are you moving and all this? And I can't wait to begin unpacking the rest of this with you. 
Because this is just the scratching of the cert, right? Man, we're ordinary people being changed by Christ to change the world. But the problem is we can have desires all day, but without a plan, those desires go away and they just become repackaged, same old, same old, and then they eventually just get reshelved, right? What's it take to make the plan go? Ordinary people being changed by Christ to change the world. That's what makes the plan go. You're not in the way of what God is doing. You're part of it. Joey, I'm really struggling right now. It doesn't matter. You're still part of what God is doing. I'm, I'm really, I don't know if I can. You're still part of what God is doing. Your story is ongoing. Your story is still being written by God. Your life is being modeled through Christ for his glory, even the ugly parts. What are you going to do about it? Now, when you leave today, I want you thinking of a couple things. Number one, we are still going to be doing this you know, in the next few weeks and really unpacking how God uses the church called grace, how we are the church for the calling, how we're going to be equipping people and understanding all these things. But to begin, I need you thinking of a few questions. And I just want you rolling these around. Number one, what kind of a disciple do I want to be? Not me, you. You are you, I am me, but you're I. Make sense? What kind of a disciple do I want to be? Secondly, secondly, what kind of difference do I want to make? What kind of a difference do I want to make in my family, at my work, where I go to school? What kind of difference do I want to make? Third question is, what are you willing to do to see it happen? What are you willing to do to see it happen? Because I promise you, it won't happen without intentionality and surrender to Jesus Christ. So what's stopping you? What's stopping you? Well, I can't. We're all ordinary people. I can't tell you what a freeing thought it is to understand that God only has screw-ups to work with. (laughs) And that the eternity of people doesn't just rest on my ability It rests on how submitted I am to God, to let him have his way, to come to him and just say, Lord, this is about you, not me. Are you willing to make that commitment to God? Because if you are, if you're willing to just step up and say, have your way, let it be what you want, a surrender to Jesus, then I promise you, ordinary as we are, he will change us so that we can go and change the world. Let's bow our heads, close our eyes. I want to pray for you in just a second, but do give you the reminder that we have people heading to our prayer stations right now. If you need to go and pray in the back, those big blue banners, we got people heading back there to pray with you. Uh, If you need to pray about anything, right, we invite you to go back there and be a part of that. But maybe you just need to take care of some business with God and surrender this to him. And in that case, I invite you to stand and sing this song with us in just a second. Just surrender who you are, what you are to Jesus. All your ordinariness, bring it to him. Father, I thank you so much for this opportunity you've given us today to worship you and to hear your word proclaimed. And and God, just to find that joy and that peace and that purpose that only you can give. Now, Father, I ask you today to call us, touch our hearts, bring us back into that fold where we are with you. Because God, too often, we're not good at this. We mess up, but Jesus, you forgive. And I thank you that your love is as inexhaustible as your power. Your mercies are new every morning. And wherever we are, God, you meet us in that ordinary and you change us so that you can change the world through us. And a lot of times, God, the world changing begins with us right in our own world. Father, let us call on you today for that. God, we're excited about the things you do. We know you're moving. We know you're working. Show us, God, how to be on board with that. And we ask it all in Christ's name. Amen.